Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you today about this uh, topic that is very close to my heart. And I know it's close to your heart, too. Um, I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes and talk through some of the reasons that I'm talking about this and some of the reasons that I was very excited when I started looking up Hager and I discovered more about what you do. I was talking to some of your colleagues about this over lunch and it feels like this is a company you're already ahead of the game. You're seeing the way that other companies are going to need to see this whole transition. So I think we're going to have more chance to talk about this. But first of all, I'm especially happy to come here because normally when I'm giving talks like this, I'm trying to persuade people to see the future. And I have the impression that you have already seen it. So that's my opening. So here I am. This is me. Um, I'm actually a scientist by training. I've worked in media. I've written many books, made radio and TV programs. I've also worked with politicians and policymakers. And I've worked a lot in the private sector and in the investment space. And in all of that time, uh, one thing that, uh, that always drives me is curiosity. So one of the things that I really like to do is go out and see the stars. And that's why I started with this picture, because that up here, is, okay, that up there is me, and I'm looking at something in the sky. So does anybody know what I'd be looking at? It's early morning, it's dawn, it was very early. Does anyone know what that will be in the sky that I'm looking at? <laughs> I keep changing it. <laughs> Good game. Any guesses? What would it be? It was early morning and it was very beautiful. Come on. What was it? Sunrise. I've seen the sunrise down there and there was some guy in the way. But this thing up in the sky, what was I looking at? Venus. Bingo. Got it one. It usually takes a lot longer to get to that. I was looking at the planet Venus. It's not even a star, it's a planet. So why am I beginning a talk about climate change with a picture of me looking at the planet Venus? Here's why. This, of course, is the Earth. It's a very beautiful planet. It's full of life. It has a beautiful blue ocean. It has the green of the land, plants. This is Venus. So these are actually to scale. Venus and the Earth are the same size, more or less. Venus is our sister planet. It's also a very similar distance from the Sun. Venus is a little bit closer to the Sun. The Earth is a little bit further away. So you'd expect Venus to be a little bit warmer and the Earth to be a little bit cooler. But if you look at them, the Earth is this beautiful planet full of life, and Venus is hell. Venus is an absolute hellhole. So if you look at the surface of Venus, it's hot enough to melt lead. It's 450 degrees C. And you could ask yourself, when these two planets are so similar, why is it? that one of them is full of life, is a comfortable place to live, and one of them is a hellhole. Now, Venus is called after the goddess of love. And I sometimes think it's appropriate that it should be a hellhole, because love, <laughs> love can be hell, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> but you could ask yourself, why? Why is one planet so much hotter than the other? And there is one difference between these planets, one difference that makes all the difference in the world. Venus's atmosphere is full of greenhouse gases. Venus's atmosphere is full of carbon dioxide. What happens when you take a planet and you pump its atmosphere full of greenhouse gases is it turns from this into that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we are doing right now with our own planet. We are filling our atmosphere with greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. And we are taking our planet from this in the direction of that. And this is one of the things that happens when you do that. This is the temperature map of the Earth. Now, until 1880 or so, we had some very long temperature records in different parts of the world, but we didn't have a global map. But from about 1880 onwards, there started to be temperature measurements everywhere in the world, actual thermometer temperature measurements. So we can tell exactly what happened to global temperature since 1880. Every five years, this is going to show a five-year average starting at 1880 and coming to the present day. If it goes a bit bluer, that was a part of the world that was colder. 
If it goes a bit redder, that was the part of the world that was hotter. I'm just going to let you see that. So this is what happens when it starts to go. We have this on the big screen. So you can see that in the early 20s, it was a little bit colder, some colder years, warmer years. Some parts of the south were actually quite a bit cooler then. 70s, 80s, 90s. So the thing is, this is not subtle. This is not subtle. I started talking about climate change about 25 years ago, and I used to say, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, if we don't do something about this, this is what we can expect to see. Well, we've got it. And here are some of the consequences. When I started talking about climate change all those years ago, it used to be hard to find photographs. Which picture should I use? I need to find a picture of a fire somewhere. Now it's hard to choose. Because if I want to put wildfires up here, I can pick the worst wildfires in Chile's history, or in Argentina's history, or in Australia's history, or in Sweden, or in Russia, or in California, or in Canada. There's too many choices. And in fact, there was one man called Frank Luntz. He was the guy who advised the Republican Party about 10, 15 years ago. He said to the Republican Party in the US, what you should do is, you should sow doubt about climate change. You should say that the science is uncertain. That way, you can continue to operate the way that you're operating. He's changed his mind. And the reason he changed his mind is that a few months ago, he had to put his wife and his mother in the car and drive as fast as he could away from the fire that was coming for his home in California. And he actually testified in Congress a couple of weeks ago, saying, this is real. We need to get over our differences, and we need to start fixing it. And by the way, plenty of homes in California have started to receive letters from insurance companies saying, we can no longer insure you against the possibility of fire. And homes in Canada, the same thing for floods. We know this, right? We experienced it this summer. And heat wave after heat wave after heat wave, especially in Europe. This is a UK... Um, newspaper that said, blast furnace for Paris. And that's really what it felt like at 42 degrees. Also, drought. We're already starting to experience loss of food production in many parts of the world. And in parts of the world, by the way, where they've done the least to cause the problem of climate change, they haven't been burning the fossil fuels, but they're experiencing more of the outcome, and they have the least resources and money to deal with it. And you might say that's a shame, it's sad for them, but it doesn't really affect me. But it kind of does. Because if you look at the thing that has hit Europe hardest in the past couple of years, it's the migration crisis. The same in the United States. And if you look at where the migrants are coming from, Guatemalan farmers, Syria, and Darfur and northern Africa, those conflicts that drove people moving are very complex geopolitical conflicts, but all three of them began with droughts. And I was talking to a military general the other day. He said, the crises of migration that you are experiencing in Europe and we are experiencing in the United States are a walk in the park compared to what's going to happen when climate refugees really start moving millions of people moving away from their homes because they can no longer make a living there. So it does affect us, and it already is affecting us. I'm, I, I promised myself I wasn't going to mention the word Brexit, and look, I just did. But, you know, it's breaking my heart what's happening to my country. And one of the biggest reasons that's happening is because of the migration crisis. And that's before it's really started to take hold. Um, it's really hard to choose which hurricane to show when I get to this point. It used to be hard to find one, now it's really hard to choose, because every new season brings a spectacular new set of hurricanes in different parts of the world, in some cases where hurricanes have never been seen before, in the northern part of the North Atlantic, in the southern part of the uh, uh, Atlantic. This one is Hurricane Irma, and um, if you can see, um, that's the island of... Um, Puerto Rico, and Irma has just gone over, the eye of uh, Irma had just gone over the island of Barbuda in the Caribbean. 
You look at the size of the islands, and you look at the size of the hurricane. And when that hurricane went over the island of Barbuda a couple of years ago, they said it was like a lawnmower had gone over the island. When it finished, there was nothing left standing. And last week, I was in Canada. I was speaking at an event in Toronto to a lot of、uh, very rich investors. And one guy came up to me afterwards. He said, "You shouldn't show that picture. You should show the picture of the hurricane that just hit the Bahamas." He said, "I had a home there, and the entire region was flattened." He said, "It looked as if a nuclear bomb had hit it." And then he said, "I used to be a climate denier. I'm not anymore." So I'm hearing that again and again. It's not something anymore that's going to be in the future. It is here with us, and it's beginning to dawn on more and more people that this is real. Now you might say, "Well, we get bad hurricanes and disasters all the time." So look at this: Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, 2013, was the strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Eastern Hemisphere. Hurricane Patricia, Mexico, 2015, the strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. And Cyclone Winston in Fiji, 2016, the strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere. Are you noticing a pattern yet? We know that there have been uh, um, severe, strange events and, and, and natural disasters in the past, but I would like to say to you, these are unnatural disasters. Have you heard the expression "the new normal"? Well, this is the new abnormal. So, do we know who this is? Come on, it's Lance Armstrong. Of course, it's Lance Armstrong. Why do I have a picture of Lance Armstrong in the big middle of a talk like this? Here's why. He's holding up seven fingers for the seven times he won the Tour de France, right? And you could ask yourself, which of those times did he win because he was on steroids? Was it the first one? The first one there? Was it the third one? Was it the seventh one? Actually, he was making every win more likely. Every time he did the Tour de France on steroids, he was making the wins more likely. And why am I telling you that? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are putting our own atmosphere on steroids, and we're making every natural disaster or unnatural disaster more likely. So don't worry too much about all the things that are written on this slide. I just wanted to show you a couple of things about it. This is to say that, as I've just shown you, as the temperatures get higher and higher, it's not just heat waves, it's not just fire, it's not just drought, it's food, it's water, it's how ecosystems that we depend on for our survival continue to function, and it's also the risk of abrupt and major irreversible changes. And if you look at the temperatures that this goes to, then. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 degrees. This was、uh, an intergovernmental panel on climate change chart to show some of the things that they would expect as the temperature increased. The world has decided that we need to keep the temperature at 2 degrees or lower, ideally 1.5 degrees. Just remember the maximum number that this comes up to, number five. And the reason that the world's decided that we need to keep it down here is that up here, especially the risk of major irreversible changes, will be impossible to stop. Now, this is a calculation of the cost of inaction. One of the things that we were talking about over lunch was we don't really know how much climate change will cost. Nobody's pricing it. Well, some people have tried, and this was the Economist Intelligence Unit. What's the value at risk from climate change? So what they calculated was that four degrees warming would give losses to assets of 4.2 trillion dollars in present value terms, which, by the way, by a staggering coincidence, is the equivalent to the total value of all the world's listed oil and gas companies. And by the way, those losses happen across the board. Now I think this is an underestimate because what it hasn't priced in is what happens when you get big irreversible changes. For example, in the northern parts of Canada and Russia, there's the permafrost. There's a lot of carbon buried inside that permafrost, twigs and leaves and branches, and also carbon in the soil, and it's all frozen. So it all just sits there. Now, if you have, have food in your freezer and you turn your freezer off, what happens? The food rots. 
When the food rots, it gives off greenhouse gases. The same thing happens when you start to melt the permafrost. When it melts, it gives off methane, which is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas, and also carbon dioxide. Now, I've been talking about this for quite a long time, and this one really worries me, because we don't know how much carbon there is down there, but if we let it all come out, there's probably more than all the greenhouse gases we've, we've created or could create ourselves. It reinforces the effect. And the question is, at what temperature change does that happen? Now, it's funny, when you talk about 1 or 1.5 or 2 degrees, it doesn't sound like much, because temperatures change more than that from one day to the next. But it's important to remember that we're talking about a baseline, a baseline going up, and all the other changes happen on the background to that. And with this baseline, you can ask me, what temperature will it take before all of that carbon in the permafrost comes out? And we don't know. It might be four degrees. It might be less than four degrees. And uh, when I started talking about this, I used to show pictures of trees just kind of lurching over, looking a bit drunk, because the soil had started to melt. But this year, the fires that took place across Russian Siberia, burning this melting soil, created a cloud of smoke the size of Europe. This is really serious. This is here and this is now. Now, I'm telling you all this, and I feel strange telling you, because I'm a scientist by training. And we don't talk about apocalypse very lightly. We're always very cautious. We always say, well, I don't really know. We need to be careful. We don't know yet. But what I'm saying now, last week I was in New York at the, at the Climate Change Summit for the United Nations. And I heard this again and again. This is now a crisis. And I was hearing it from CEOs. I heard it, the, um, the, the head of Sustainable Energy for All, Rachel Kite, used to be uh, deputy director of the World Bank. She's a very smart, sensible person, and she said, I'm hitting code red on the climate. So, do you remember that chart that I showed you about all the different, the food, the water, all of those things? I, I said the temperature that it went up to. Do you remember it was one degree, two degree, three degrees? What was the maximum temperature that chart had? Did anyone remember? It was five degrees. So this is Fatty Birol, the chief executive of the IAA. A couple of years ago, he said, we are following a six degree trajectory every year in a very loyal way. Even school children know this will have catastrophic implications for all of us. I'm going to come back to the school children later. But if it was the plan to warm our planet in the direction of Venus by six degrees, we could not be following it more faithfully. That's how serious this is. And that's why I was excited to be coming and talking particularly to you guys, because there are solutions, and we have to be ready for them, because the alternative is just not to be imagined. Many people have noticed this. So some of the first uh, sectors to notice this were the energy sector, but the, the finance sector has started to wake up. I and mean, that's largely in part because of this guy, um, Mark Carney. He's the governor of the Bank of England, and he's also the chairman of the Financial Stability Board. And he, a couple of years ago, he said something very revolutionary. Climate change isn't just something for tree huggers and environmentalists. Climate change presents significant risks for global financial stability. That's the kind of language that gets to investors. This isn't about being nice, this is about protecting our own investments and assets. He highlighted three ways in which that could happen. Direct physical risks, liability risks, and the risks from transition costs. I'll just go through each of those in turn, the direct physical risks first. I'm sure that you'd understand that when I was showing you the fires and the floods, and the droughts and the storms, you can understand the assault that individual assets, factories, and supply chains can be experiencing. It's not just if your own individual factory is in the, fi in the, in the flight, plan of a, uh, flight plan of a fire, but also if anyone in your supply chain is. I've got just one example more to show you, which is what happened to Houston. This is a refinery in Houston that was flooded out when Hurricane Harvey went overhead. One thing that happens with climate change is that the hurricanes become more intense. Another is that they stay around longer because high-altitude winds can actually weaken. So what happened is Hurricane Harvey arrived over Houston and then sat there and dumped all of its load of rain 
down onto Houston. This is amazing. It, it dumped so much rain, the city staggered under the weight. The city of Houston sank by two centimeters under the weight of this storm. And that's the kind of attacks that individual assets are now ready to be feeling, and that's what was worrying Mark Carney. What about um, liability risk? Liability covers several things. It covers the risk of litigation, so legal risk. It covers uh, what happens to you if, if, if you lose reputation. And it also covers um, whether, you, uh, whether, you, whether there's new regulations that will come out that will destroy your business model. So those three things, new regulations that hurt your business model, litigation, and loss of reputation. Again, I have one picture to illustrate all three of these. Are you ready for this? One picture. Ready? This, my friends, is Martin Winterkorn, the former CEO of VW, who thought it was a good idea to cheat on his emission test because nobody would ever know, and if they did know, they wouldn't care. So litigation, he's actually been indicted himself. He will probably go to prison over this. The cost of the company was immediately something of the order of $30 billion. Massive reputation hit. I think it's very interesting to look at what VW did next, and I'll come back to that in a little while. But if you're invested in VW, this is a serious thing for you to know about. Third thing, risk from transition costs. This is what's often called stranded assets. If you've invested in something that's got a sort of 20 or 30-year lifespan, like a, a coal-fired power plant, for instance, and then the world decides it doesn't want coal anymore, the value just slips through your fingers. So. New movements in the investment world. I mentioned this one thing, Climate Action 100. It's called 100 because there's 100 companies responsible for most of the emissions in the world, and they're sort of trying to target those. Uh, investors with more than 32 trillion assets under management are working with companies to try to influence their climate strategy. This really surprised me. For example, Glencore. Glencore, major commodities business, recently announced it's capping coal production at present levels and aligning its business and investments with the Paris climate goals. It's very interesting. I, I, I'm going to come back to this again and again. In this situation, industry, businesses, corporations are taking a lead, and I think that that's going to get us out of this mess. This is Mike Bloomberg. He said it's critical that in industries and investors understand the risks posed by climate change. Please try to understand that the, how impressive it is that the people who are saying now we have to understand the risks are not anymore Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. This is the governor of the Bank of England, the chair of the Financial Stability Board Task Force on all of this. So he and Mark Carney got together, they did this big task force, they involved lots of companies, they involved lots of investors, and they came up with recommendations how every company in the world needs to report its climate risk alongside its financial returns, not in a, some sustainability report, but right there alongside the financial returns. And as of June this year, companies with a combined market cap of more than 9.3 trillion had signed up to that. This is a revolution happening right in front of us right now. And within that, I've got here the European Commission, a global approach to sustainable finance. The European Commission is all over looking at what regulations it can bring into play to enforce sustainable finance. Again, so it's not just something that happens on the side to, to, for, for responsible investors, but it's something that happens mainstream across the board. Politically speaking, I've said that I think industry is leading the way, but there was something that happened that was actually a miracle. I mean, look at this for a moment. Look at these guys. 190-odd world leaders. Imagine getting them to agree unanimously about anything. And what they agreed unanimously about was 30 pages of very complicated legal text saying we're going to act on climate change. They're not doing enough, they're not doing it fast enough, but this sent a signal around the world that changed everything. And I said last week I was in New York, and then two things that I thought were very striking that came out in the climate summit. First of all, the principles for responsible investment. Another big global alliance of investors. They have $80 trillion that they're handling assets under management between them. They talked about an inevitable, rapid, and forceful 
climate policy response coming out within the next five years. And one of the reasons for that is that nearly 80 countries have set this target that I'm very proud to say France and the UK have already set into legal obligation. Net zero by 2050. Look out for this. In the next 30 years, this is a radical transformation of every way that we use to do business. So what does that look like? Solutions. The sun, solar power, of course, has done this spectacular thing. This is what's happened to the price of uh, silicon PV cells. Um, nobody saw this happening. Nobody expected this. And yet now wind is taking the same pattern, in large part because of interventions by governments and also because of the role of China in the, in the manufacturing. But nonetheless, this is a very radical change. Wind, especially offshore wind. Um, I put this in hydrogen. This is something that has come back, is making a, a comeback. Uh, a few years ago, hydrogen, maybe 10, 15 years ago, a lot of people were talking about the hydrogen economy. But it was basically going to be for running cars, hydrogen fuel cells. And then electrification came along, and that became much more interesting, and blah, blah. Now it's back for all sorts of different reasons, partly because of the issue of storage from season to season. If you have solar and wind and it's intermittent, then how do you store the energy? Maybe you could make hydrogen and then burn it to remake the electricity a few months later or travel it, uh, take it around the world. There's also the potential to use hydrogen for heating of buildings. There's a potential to use hydrogen in, in very difficult areas like steel, cement, chemicals that we haven't really been thinking about. So hydrogen is making a very big comeback. Carbon capture and storage. You will be hearing a lot about this, mainly because we've left it too late. We can't just gently and smoothly put lots more sun and wind, and then we'll be fine. We have to take out some of the CO2 that's already there in the atmosphere. And we also have to help with some of those, those sectors like, um, like cement and steel and chemicals. This will do that. Look at this beauty. So this was actually, it, what was it, just a, like a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it, the Frankfurt Motor Show? This is an all-electric Porsche. And when I, I promised you that I was going to talk about what happened next for VW, and this is what happened next, also unveiled a couple of weeks ago at the Frankfurt Motor Show. This is the ID3, the first ever all-electric, from the ground up, VW car. This is the people's car, and it costs, what, 25,000 euros? These are game changers. It's not, it's not about wacky Tesla anymore. This is about every car company that I speak to say the only thing we care about is electric. And I don't, has anyone driven an electric vehicle? They're awesome. <laughs> when I discovered, when my friends who are petrol heads who love cars started telling me how excited they were about driving this, the acceleration, the torque, it's fantastic. They are brilliant to drive. I, I think the inter internal combustion engine is really very last year. One reason I put the EVs in is something that's very relevant, I think, to Hager. Uh, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance predicts that EVs are going to be competitive even without subsidies across the world within the next four or five years. They say by 2040, 55% of all new car sales and 33% of the global fleet will be electric. That's a massive change. And of course, you have the storage potential of charged vehicles to balance electric transition goods. I'm hearing more and more about this, and this is directly relevant to your business. Who is capable of designing the system whereby electric vehicles plugged in can provide a universal storage solution? This is what 21st century CEOs look like. This is Isabel Kosher. She is a cocher. She is the CEO of Engie in Paris. She, she became CEO about three years ago and made a very, very radical change in strategy for that uh, industry, for that um, company. She said this, I'm convinced that we're entering a new era in which companies will increasingly be judged by their overall impact on society and the environment. Companies that refuse to assume these responsibilities are doomed. So this is what Angie did. Number one, she said we had a strategic epiphany. 
She became CEO, she got all of her senior team together, her leadership team, and said, what are we going to change? This is what they did. Engie has sold off or closed down nearly 15 billion fossil fuel-related assets. Sold off or closed down. They're reinvesting in low-carbon activities, which already produce 90% of their revenue. Incredible speed of change for a new strategy for a company like that, for a utility. They're focusing on energy efficiency, renewables, hydrogen, and electric vehicles. Also, district heating and cooling systems. That's a good bit. The share price has gone up by more than 17%. And here's an example. This is actually a, a district cooling system. They're also looking into district heating systems. Cooling is going to be so important, especially as parts of the world that haven't been able to afford cooling solutions are now being lifted out of poverty. And the extra drain that that's going to cause on, on electricity systems and what can be done about that in terms of improving efficiency is a really important area to look at. This is also what a 21st century CEO looks like. So I gave you a younger white woman, I'm giving you an older white man. This is Francesco Storace, who is CEO of NL, Italian utility, of course. There is a huge tide flowing, he said, and you can only decide in which direction you want to swim. The tide is not in our control, it is the evolution of technology. So this is what he did. So he's the gentleman on the, left, on the right here, and this gentleman on the left is Kumi Naidu. Kumi Naidu, at the time, was the CEO of Greenpeace International. Francesco Storacci invited Kumi into his office and made a plan with him. They made a new strategy to decarbonize NL. Got Greenpeace's authority, got Greenpeace's um, uh, respect for the plan that he was doing. And then the two of them announced it jointly at a press conference. The CEO of a fossil fuel-based utility and the CEO of Greenpeace side by side. This is a really new world. And I think alliances like this are going to be increasingly important as we go forwards. We are actually all in this together. This is another example of a 21st century CEO. More and more our customers want us to lead, said Chris Nassetta, who is president and CEO of Hilton. This is perhaps more directly relevant to what you guys do, because they looked at their entire fleet of Hilton hotels starting about 10 years ago, and said, we need to make a change. So what did they do? They built a proprietary technology that was called Lightstay, that measures the environmental footprint across all their brand hotels. Since then, they've collectively reduced using that, measure, monitor, and reduce. They, they, they put KPIs, they gave incentives aligned to these measurements. Energy use by 22%, carbon emissions by 30%, water use by 22%, and waste by more than 30%. And get this, I actually said to him when I met him, I said, how did you persuade people to go along with this? He said it was easy. We've saved a billion dollars. They now set a new target to halve their environmental footprint by 2030. And he's saying it's not enough just for us to do it, he's saying to the rest of the sector, come join us, we can help you with our technology or find your own technology, but this is the way you have to go. This is where opportunity lies for companies like yours. Um, advancing net zero. This is a, a, a program to try and drive the, the transition to a net zero carbon built environment. So the World Green Building Council report in July 2019, who put this out, said that all new buildings should be net zero by 2030 everywhere in the world. All buildings should be net zero by 2050. You should measure your emissions. You should reduce energy demand and generate the balance from net zero carbon sources. That all sounds very good and noble. Yes, let's call for that. But look at this. I'm sure you already know it, but just in case you don't. The European Commission Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. All new buildings have to be nearly zero energy from next year. Member states have to create roadmaps for retrofitting existing stock. The aim is for full decarbonization of all the building stock across Europe by 2050. So I picked out a few examples of positive energy houses. There's so some very wacky and futuristic ones showing what you can do with a genuinely smart home. So here we have, this is a home in uh, Norway, which is, uh, actually generates more electricity than it consumes. 
I like this one. This is in Freiburg in Germany. I think it's called the heliotrope. It actually moves by 180 degrees to track the sun. So you, not, you don't just maximize the sun on the solar panels, but also you maximize the daylight in the home. This is a normal boring one in, in Wales, in Cardiff. But we're going to need normal boring smart homes because we're all going to have to have them. And this is a house that I visited, a building that I visited in Bangalore 15 years ago. I was fascinated by this building when I went in because they were showing what could be done. This is the advanced like home of the future, building of the future, and it's called the Energy Research uh, Initiative, Terry. And the woman showing me around showed me they had daylighting throughout the building, so the floors and the ceilings had, had glass in them so that the daylight went all the way through. Everybody had a, a low-energy light bulb at their work, workstation, but almost nobody switched it on because they had natural daylight everywhere. They had a big atrium with a massive tree in it. They had uh, heating, a solar heating on the roof. And they had a solar chimney at the back of the building that was heated up by the sun and let air rise and draw air gently through each of the different floors up into the chimney. And that meant they didn't have air conditioning. In Bangalore in the summer, they didn't have air conditioning. They just had a cooling, gentle breeze. And I said, do you like working here? She said, I love it. I love it. My friends down the road, they work in a call center. They have strip lighting, and they have air conditioning. Their skin dries out, they get headaches, they get the lighting, they go home so tired. I go home fresh as a flower. She loved it. And I've remembered that because it's not a very, it's an ugly looking building. It's not as cool and futuristic as the others. But it shows that when we get this right with smart buildings, they're gorgeous. They're much more pleasant to be in. It's not the old story that you, you have to sacrifice everything to make this transition. We do it smart, we get a better world, not just because we don't have the storms and floods and fires, but because the environment we live in is more human and better. Okay, so this is me again, um, on one of my adventurous trips. I'm in a rainforest. Has anyone been to a rainforest? Anyone? Am I the only one? Two, three, a few people. They're magical places, even more so than regular forests, because everything in them gets recycled. If you stand there still, you can almost hear all the eating, the munching, the, the sound of any leaf that falls immediately gets eaten by something. There's recycling, recycling, recycling. Nothing is wasted. Nature doesn't waste, not because nature is noble, but because nature isn't stupid. Because organisms that waste go extinct. So focusing on waste and thinking about a circular economy is also going to be something that's very important. How do we turn something linear into something circular so you build into the design at the beginning what's going to happen to it at the end? How you can go from what they call cradle to cradle and keep the materials recycling instead of just wasting and throwing it away. This is Steve Howard, who was uh, CSO, Chief uh, Sustainability Officer of IKEA. He said, we've reached peak stuff. We'll be increasingly building a circular IKEA where you can repair and recycle products. Here's some of the things that they've done now. They're aiming to design all IKEA products using circular principles and use only renewable and recycled materials by 2030. They also want to reduce the total climate footprint of products by 70% by 2030. They don't have solutions yet for how to do that, but they've made the commitment, the target. So anyone who is providing solutions is going to have some very interested customers out there. Oh, by the way, I wanted to mention about IKEA. I discovered this morning that IKEA just put out a notice saying that by the end of this year, the IKEA buildings will collectively produce more energy than they consume everywhere in the world by the end of this year, in the next few months. This is the future. Philips is just another example. There's so many examples, I don't have time to show you them all, but they are aiming for 100% revenue from circular solutions by 2025, and also carbon neutral operations and 100% renewable electricity by next year. This is an extraordinary story. I promised you I was going to come back to the school children that Fatih Birol mentioned. And who knew that they would be out on the streets like this? This is young Greta Thunberg. She's sitting outside Parliament with her school strike for climate on her own, this little lonely figure. This was the last Friday 
I'm actually in this crowd, but I'm not going to make you try and spot me. She sparked a movement, and the estimate is that from last Friday and this Friday, the two global climate strikes that she called, seven million people, seven million people were out on the streets, the vast majority of them children. So from this to this was one year. And look at their faces. I was there. I heard her speak in Washington. I heard her speak in New York. And then I was there for the children's climate strike in Toronto. And they were carrying banners that said, "How dare you!" And when Greta gave her speech to the United Nations, she said, "We are going to have to pull your CO2 out of the atmosphere. My generation is going to have to clean up." Your mess, and we know, we see you, we know that. And I walked along in Toronto, and I saw these kids with their banners. And you know what? I cried. And I'm a pointy-headed scientist; I don't cry lightly. Partly because they're rising up, and that's helping, giving a sense of urgency—the urgency that we actually need. And partly because I thought we are failing them. The most sacred duty of adults on this world is to protect the children, and we are failing them. I used to say, "The next generation will have to suffer." Blah blah. blah. Well, they're out on the streets right now. So this is a crisis. This is a crisis, and I really don't say that lightly. And if there's one thing you take away from this talk today, please tell your friends. We've got to get really serious now. But it's also a massive opportunity. And I said at the beginning, I was excited to talk to you because already, in the way that you're thinking and the products that you're making, you're ahead of the game. And I do believe, first of all. That with the government setting their new targets, with all these businesses setting their new targets, there was also a new collective of businesses. I think about 80 businesses in New York with a collective market capitalization of 2.3 trillion dollars, so that they were going to set net zero targets as businesses. And again, they don't know how to do it. They're setting the target, then they say, "Where are the solutions? Who can sell them to me? Who can help me work, work on them together?" This is going to be a very big market. And so this is Peter Drucker. Famous management guru, and this is what I'm ending on. Every single social and global issue of our day is a business opportunity in disguise. I believe in business. I believe that business is going to be the way that we get our way out, ourselves out of this. But we have to get really serious right now. Thanks very much. <laughs>